place. And again, it speaks to the mom and pop shop that the 49ers were. I mean, I grew up with Keysar Stadium because I was raised in the Richmond District in San Francisco, so I could walk to Keysar Stadium. And so I spent half my misspent youth at, at Keysar Stadium. <laughs> Because, because the high schools played on it, too. So it would get, by the, by the middle of the season, and especially when it got closer to the rainy season in October, November, uh, it was a swamp because the high schools played on it. It wasn't maintained. You know, it, in the middle of the field was mud. It was, it was awful. I mean, but that's, that's what you had. <laughs> This, this is, brings back fond memories. Broke my shoulder one time, laid down here. I remember, lost my five teeth in that one play, came in here, got all shot up. Yeah, I remember distinctly. Yeah, this, this was it. The small benches and everything's, everything's the same. It's just like a museum in here. It's just, brings back such great memories of when I played here as a, at Poly High and USF up the hill and the college and then with all those years with the 49ers. God, and it was all in here. This is just great. In some ways it was an awful stadium. But when you think back and you're nostalgic, I think you think about the best parts. And, and one of the best parts about Kizar was that it was truly a neighborhood stadium. People could watch from the rooftops across the street from us. I think they sold seats up there. You know, you could sit up there and people had their parties all the time right on top of their house and watch the game. Albert returned to the Bay Area in 1946 and began his next pioneering adventure as quarterback of the very first San Francisco 49ers team. Albert threw 29 touchdown passes, was named the league's MVP, and again showcased his magician-like tricks. He would just as soon pull it down and run as hand it off. He'd quick kick it. He'd throw a jump pass. You know, it was very difficult for defenses to prepare for. Sometimes Albert would even fool his own teammates. You know, I saw the ball got snapped and he caught it. And I was moving up to kick it. And uh, when I got there, the ball wasn't there. He had picked it up and he was bootlegging it into the end zone. After seven years with the 49ers, six of them winning ones, Albert played one more season in Canada before retiring as a player and then, at age 36, became the 49ers head coach for three seasons, winning 19 of 37 games and taking them to their first NFL playoff appearance in 1957. was a classic NFL fullback. He was part of the famed million dollar backfield in San Francisco, playing alongside halfbacks Hugh McElhenney and Joe Perry and quarterback Y.A. Tittle. All four men are in the Pro Football Hall of Fame and John Henry's bruising play is a big reason why. 
I was a, a good hitter. I liked to hit and block, and you had to block for the quarterback and for the other backs, so I was proficient at that. Well, I enjoyed blocking. It gave me a chance to hit the guy and knock him down, you know, and, and see one of our backs to set, succeed and make a lot of yards from it. It made me feel real good. Johnson's blocking helped Joe Perry, number 34, win back-to-back -back rushing titles in 1953 and 54. But John Henry was equally dangerous as a runner, and his opponents knew it. If you're a running back, if you're a good running back, and you're a threat to them, they take extra things, try to punish you, try to scare you, try to intimidate you. You know, they do all things to you. You know, they twist your arm, twist your legs, they bite you, they put the rub your hands in your eyes, they do every little thing to intimidate you. So you have to you have to counter attack them, you know. So I hit him with my elbow, I just got my elbow. Joe Perry was a standout. He became the first back to rush for more than a thousand yards in consecutive seasons. To me, you can't coach a kid how to run. He has to have innate ability, uh, instinctive powers, or, or whatever. You can't tell him, "Hey, when you get to here, run out of bounds." Uh, I don't. I don't believe in that. That's that's the way I was brought up. If if you can't get around him, go over him, and. Uh, that's the way I was taught, and that's the way I ran, and that's the way most of the guys doing my ear ran. Joe, the Jet Perry displays the running form that established him as the best ball carrier in the league as he completes a 55-yard touchdown gallop, and the 49ers take over the lead. He now watches the game he once ruled. For during the 50s, Hugh McElhenney was not just the best. He was the king. Running with a football is, is a sense. Uh, after the ball is snapped and you get the ball, you're really not thinking. You're just kind of reacting. And you go to an area, but you react from that point. I was never an individual that liked to, or appreciated body contact, so I always tried to avoid it as much as I could. And maybe that was the reason that I ran the, the way I did. Tittle never won an NFL championship, but over the course of a 17-year career, he did just about everything else. Born Yelverton Abraham Tittle in 1926, YA would go on to become one of the most tenacious quarterbacks in history. Tittle grew up in Texas and played football at LSU, where he was MVP of the 1947 Cotton Bowl. After a brief stint with the Colts, Tittle joined the San Francisco 49ers in 1951. He would remain with the club for 10 seasons, six of which he would serve as the team's primary starter. Before Hail Mary became part of football vocabulary, fans got to know Tittle's famed alley-oop. I never thought as a quarterback I'd ever resort to throwing an end over end lob lolly pass straight up in the air, but that's what the alley-oop pass was. Again, Owens flank to the right. This has got to be the alley-oop. There's no time for anything else. Tittle throws. Owens is double team. He's going downfield. He has a goal line. He goes up. He's got it. True son of San Francisco, where his legendary career was born, 
nurtured, and ended in Kizar Stadium. For 17 seasons that spanned high school, college, and the pros, Bob played an astounding 189 home games. Kizar to me was, was my first love. This was San Francisco's baby. This is where you played football. At Kizar, Bob, number 79, displayed equal parts speed and intelligence, power and ferocity, and a flamboyant personality that included a penchant for eating raw meat that he'd learned from his grandmother. I remember just as a little kid reaching up and trying to, you know, get and she would give me a piece of meat every once in a while. Uh, she'd throw a piece of the dog. Uh, we had a dog named Fluffy. Hey, Fluffy, boom, you know, and then, hey, Bobby, and she'd give me a piece as well. In fact, it, you know, later on, it got to the point where, you know, I would fight the dog for who got the most meat. In 1953, the 49ers drafted Bob in the third round. And at six foot nine and 265 pounds, he became the tallest player in the NFL and would remain that for nearly two decades. He was also one of the most durable intimidators to play the game. I played with no face mask for three years. I lost five teeth on one play, blocking a punt. I uh, broke my shoulder, played the, the whole the rest of the game with a broken shoulder. I played offense and defense for my first three years every down. So I'd say to them, I don't think the question should be whether or not guys like me could play in today's league. I think the question should be whether these candy asses could have played with us. Named the best defensive tackle of pro football's first 50 years, Leo Namalini first played the game in the Marine Corps. After fighting with the Pacific invasion forces in World War II, Namalini signed on with the San Francisco 49ers. Son of an immigrant family, football allowed him to escape the poverty of Chicago's northeast side and attain unaccustomed luxury and success. Leo was a very gifted football player. He would play good all the time. Um, but when he played outstanding is when he was mad. And we would have to make up stories about the other players, what they were saying about his family or uh, some of the silly type thing. They really, and he would get really upset with things like that. That guy did this, Leo, and he said this about you, and you know, and, and then Leo said, I'm going to kill that guy. Even though he was big, he was very easy going. And you really had to get him riled up, and his boiling point was very uh, low. And once it was, was ignited, though, watch out. He was a terror. Nomalini was next to impossible to stop, and he picked up a few tricks from a second career as Leo the Lion. Nomo, you know, was a wrestler. He, he wrestled in the off-season. Well, one year, when I was the head coach, he wrestled the night before we went to training camp, and the headlines the next morning, Nomalini injured in wrestling match. Questionable for season. Well, I knew what a big joke it was. Nomo was wrestling in his last match before the football season was over, because, and then he's going to have to lose. One of the first truly versatile linemen, Namalini never missed a game, and he became one of the few players to be named All-Pro on both defense and offense. Leo was the toughest there was in the roughest era of pro football, the 1950s. You're going to find somebody once in a while that's going to maybe bring an elbow up or maybe use a knee, but then no things happen. There wasn't that much dirty play. It was rough. Yeah, they were rough. They, if they could kill you, they kill you honestly. Okay? But nothing dirty. Nothing wrong with drawing a little blood here and there. You know what that is. His name? Dave Wilcox. Defensively, I had an area, and I did not like people in that area. Uh, so when I prepared to play the game, 
It was to keep everybody out of that area. Nobody was going to run in my area. Nobody was going to pass in my area. This is my spot, and nobody was welcome there except me. <laughs> his opponents remember him for three things. First, his intensity. Dominated people. Dick Butkus was great because he dominated people. Dave Wilcox dominated people. I could find a piece of film every week where he'd take a guy and carry him over and lay him on a pile. Well, who did that with a 265-pound man? And he never knew he was doing these things. I mean, I can remember John Mackey as great as he was. All the great tight ends had come into Keysar Stadium or wherever we'd go. They never caught Diddley. They beat us every other way, but nobody could get off the line. A lot of linebackers have that same size, speed. Uh, I can recall watching Wilcox between plays. He had a way of crossing his legs and looked nonchalant. But the fact is, once that ball was snapped, he brought an intensity, whether it was on a blitz, whether it was on a, a covering a man, or making the tackle. I, I, I got to say, Dave Wilcox is everything and played the position as well as anybody that's ever played the position. Wilcox was the kind of guy that thrived on pressure. He would want you to come to his side. Don't run away from me if it's third and one. Come to my side. Challenge the best. and agile, Jimmy Johnson immediately made an impact when he came into the NFL in 1961, intercepting five passes as a rookie. Throughout his 16-year career, Johnson had a knack for making acrobatic plays. His 47 career picks resulted in 615 return yards. Both were 49ers records when he retired. Uh, say the friendly confines of Wrigley Field. Well, uh, Keysar Stadium wasn't so friendly, but uh, the confines were very close. People could almost touch the players. They could see the expressions. It was a great place to broadcast a football game. From. Looking. Does. Stops. Throws. Completes it to Kilmer up at the 30-yard line. Kilmer driving for the first down. Loses the football. It's picked up by Jim Marshall, who's running the wrong way. Marshall is running the wrong Players used to have to leave through a tunnel, and the fans would hang over this tunnel, and they'd throw things at the opposing team, just throw, you know, garbage and spill beers and all that kind of stuff on the opposing team. When they left, they finally put a screen around it. So they still got hit with beer and that kind of stuff, but at least they didn't get pummeled by fans while they were walking to the, to the locker room, you know. And the locker rooms were, they weren't as nice as any high school locker room in the city now. I mean, they were terrible. You hung your clothes on a hook. I remember as a ball boy, as you leave the field, you kind of take your time. You never want to be the first guy in there. You wanted to uh, let the fans unload most of their ammunition. And the second thing, you never wanted to be around John Brody because John Brody was the target uh, Sunday after Sunday. So if you could see Brody get into the uh, tunnel, and then you knew it was clear to go in yourself. This hasn't changed in 30 years. First time I've been back here. Uh, dirt floor, could really kick up a lot of dust. And when you had 50 players on each team, 100 players or so going through here, you can imagine the amount of dust that they kicked up and uh, how unhealthy that was for you. Speaking of unhealthy, we're not sure what this pipe's for. Well, I think they ought to run this stuff through the lab. Yeah, there's one of Monty Stickles, Lugies. Although old Kizar Stadium was torn down long ago, it still looms large on the landscape of the heart. Everything started there. It, it, it germinated in, in that stadium. It's, it's where we all grew up, all the 49er fans. The roots of the team, that, that's where they're at. They, they, they were established in Kizar. 
on January 3rd, 1971, the San Francisco 49ers played their last game at Kizar Stadium and lost to the Dallas Cowboys 17-10 in the NFC Championship game. I left the game as an extremely dejected 15-year-old boy. My last image of Kizar Stadium being the hideous sight of the Cowboys players celebrating on our field. As we were leaving the stadium, numerous fights broke out and over a dozen spectators were arrested. The Cowboys went on to lose in the Super Bowl to the then Baltimore Colts. But for me, the 49ers-Cowboys rivalry started that day.